Hello and welcome to another screencast from NERCL. Today's screencast is regarding radio server configuration within the TurboNet Enterprise platform version 2.8 release 15. I'm obviously making the assumption you have the TurboNet Enterprise radio server and installed onto the server PC along with Microsoft SQL Server Express. To initiate the configurator for the radio server software, locate this icon on your desktop or alternatively navigate through the your comp software option. There we go, relatively straightforward. We'll start at the top service parameter. At the moment the service is running, we can stop the service and believe it or not, start the service. If you do any changes within these parameters, you must save changes and restart the service unless these changes will not take effect. There you go, the service is running again. Network, again, leave these as default. You can change them, strongly recommend you don't. Database is probably one of the most important sections within this configurator. Top section deals with the SQL server. Middle section deals with specific file paths if you want to save them in non-default areas. Um, again, I'll quickly run through. The assumption is made that you have Microsoft SQL server installed on the radio server PC. Um, the server path must be on here, correct? Again, we have give the database a name. The authentication is SQL server. Login, SA, and I give it a password. Again, I'll not go into the SQL setup. That'll be done for another day. Um, I can specify paths for the database archives or a custom folder for the audio files, which I actually have here. Turbinet Audio is currently located in C drive. I want to see. There we go. Has its own. And there's a list of audio files there, typically the date and the hour. So that's the 17th of January. 2012, that's 11 o'clock. Typically, that'll be 11 o'clock at night, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Just as a guide. And if I click on there, there's all the audios. Once your database is set up, the first thing you need to do is, if on, the, on the first running of this software, you need to create the database. Uh, I've already created it, so I won't select that one. But what we do is we can test the connection. If we select Test Connect and nothing is it comes up with an error, nothing's going to work. Again, if you upgrade the software to a newer version, you need to upgrade the database first, and then we can test it. So, as a test, testing the connection between the server program and the database, the underlying database um, that sits behind all this, is probably one of the most important tests you can do. Go to service management quickly. Again, all this is relatively straightforward. If you're using uh, telemetry, um, you can request the GPIO uh, levels, uh, status of these levels, sorry, on power up. Um, advanced settings, again, English login levels. Again, I'd advise you not to change these from default. You can, if you understand the what they're asking. Um, TX passive timeout, for instance, is unlimited, but you could say, um, change it to, say, 12 hours. So after 12 hours, anybody who records any TX messages will just be um, binned. But obviously, we'll keep it unlimited for the time being. Set defaults on the side there. Local agents, well these local agents are the master radios or the, the control radios attached to the radio server. The term local is obviously because they have a direct connection to the radio server. It's not via a uh, a WAN or a LAN network. Um, enable the services, ID, radio network, ID, radio groups. Again, I've left these as default. You can change these if you like, but then this code plug on the radios have to be changed. And again, I have two master radios or two control radios attached to my radio server. I give them names VHF1, UHF1. These IP addresses, again, are unique. Uh, I've given them dot fifty dot one dot fifty one dot one and radio IDs 
80,002. Services, again, I will urge not to change these. These are default settings, leave them as that, unless instructed to do so. Um, and there we get into the specific control radios. If I deal with VHF1, give it a name, VHF1, I could change it to. Change it to whatever. I'll keep it back to VHF1. Uh, that's the radio ID. Again, IP address. Another important thing to point out is you can test the connection. There we have it. It's the latest firmware version up to date. Give you the radio serial number. Uh, mode, uh, single station, capacity plus, or IP site connect. Leave it as single station. Uh, and again, there's some various tick boxes we can change if we like. More importantly, is for each master radio, we have to declare its audio path for the playback and recording device. Um, if I quickly scroll through VHF1 and UHF1, my sound cards are currently external USB sound cards. And as you can see, they change. Obviously, you can, if you make any changes, you can then recycle it. Relatively straightforward to set up. We don't have any an, any analog master radios. Again, remote agents. We don't have any connected up in this demo setup. IP interconnect uh, for telephony. Um, again, just to quickly run through this, uh, I've ticked the box to say yes. I like that feature. Um, I'm using SIPgate for a small demo number. Uh, the provider address is SIPgate.co.uk. Provider port. That's a standard 5060s. A standard. Um, SIP port. Again, I can test it to see if the provider is available. Again, my local IP address is the radio server IP address on my network. Um, it's dot zero dot twenty. Again, the port's fifty sixty. Um, there's three methods to handle calls, incoming calls. You can, you can decline calls. You can open the voice menu or redirect to dispatchers. I'll redirect to dispatchers. Allow subscribers to make outgoing calls. TMS prefix SIP could be anything. So if a subscriber puts a text, SIP, colon, and a number, then the hand portable can dial out using the server as a, as a, as a, as a switch. Um, enable DTMF for new for the newer features on the firmware. And again, this bit, SIP ID, SIP user as the telephone number and a password. Again, advanced settings, I would all leave these as standard. Okay, a couple of things worth pointing out. Master radios on Win 7 Professional. If I hover over this um, network icon here, it's telling me I have network 164. Or oh, if I move my print screen a second, right click on here, paste. It's shown you here. Network 164 is one of the radios. Network 163 is the other radio. And I have um, internet access. Don't save. Right click on here and open Network Sharing Center. And basically, there's where internet connection up here. One radio, the other radio, and again. They all have local area connections. If you can hover over there and you actually see two networks, then you know your chances are your your master radios are connected to the radio server PC. Another way of doing it is go to control panel. Hardware and sound device manager. Enlarge that for us. If you look on network adapters, double click, and there we go. There's our LAN port, and there's Motor Turbo Radio 2, Motor Turbo Radio 5. Again, it's always devices work properly. Generally gives you confidence that the Motor Turbo Radio is actually connected to the PC correctly. Again, if you have four radios attached, you'd expect to see four network connections.
just a recap on the radio server configurator database very very important if this is wrong then this will not be able to be achieved some of these details like database name would have been entered during the installation of the SQL server software than previous and again the second probably most important section is the master radio configuration again radio ID very important IP address again just as equally as important and this is where most of the time it goes wrong is the playback device and recorder device how the master radio is connected to the audio IOs and there you go hopefully a quick look at the radio server configuration thank you very much